Welcome to the Data and AI World Tour. I'm super excited to talk to you about the rise of the data lake house. So you all know it, the FANGs use data, analytics, and AI to disrupt whole industries. In fact, companies like Google or Facebook wouldn't even be around today if it wasn't for data and AI. But today, we're also now seeing large enterprises as well being successful with data, analytics, and AI. I'm going to give you three examples from three different verticals that I find super inspiring. So in the healthcare space, a company like Regeneron is able to actually now take data from patients and genomics into the Databricks data lake house. And using machine learning, they can speed up how they find genomes 600x. And that way, they were able to actually develop a drug for chronic liver disease, where they found the genome responsible for it in the data lake house. In a different vertical, JB Hunt, which is a transportation carrier, is focused on building the most efficient transportation network in the world. The Carrier 360 analytics platform that they built delivers real-time insights across 100,000 vehicles and equipment across North America. The strategy has saved the company millions of operating costs, increased driver productivity, and it's improving driver safety. In a different vertical, in the financial services sector, ABN AMRO delivered cutting-edge machine learning-powered risk management and fraud detection to improve their customer experiences. The bank had hundreds of terabytes of data from over 150 sources. The complexity of their tech stack got in the way of moving fast to make use of this data. They moved off of on-prem Hadoop to the cloud and built one stack to handle their analytics and AI workloads on the data lake house. Now they're able to uncover insights 10 times faster and get new machine learning projects into production in just five weeks versus the 18 months in the past. So what do these companies have in common? How do they do it? How do these companies crack the code on really leveraging data analytics and AI? Well, there's four truths that they all follow, and I'm going to walk you through those. One, they all leverage machine learning and AI because they believe it's the future, and they use it in a very strategic way, and they built their tech stacks from the ground up supporting machine learning and AI. Second, they all leveraged open source and open formats, and I'll tell you why. And three, they all plan for multi-cloud. So now they're getting the best of breed from each of the cloud vendors, and they're able to leverage their negotiations when they're actually uh, signing those contracts. And four, surprisingly, when you look at their actual data architecture, they have very simple data architectures compared to other companies that are struggling with this. So let's go through each of these. One. All enterprises that we see really being successful with data analytics and AI really embrace ML and AI. How do they do it? Well, if you look at most companies, it all starts with the data. They all have data, but there's a maturity cycle that they go through. The first parts of the cycle have to do with what happened in the past. So you collect your data, you're trying to understand what happened with my revenue, what happened with my products in the past. That's largely done by data warehousing and BI. So that's great. But the companies that are really leveraging data and AI in a strategic way, they're able to move further right in this maturity cycle, and they're able to actually start asking predictive questions of, why did this happen? What will happen in the future? And can we automate this so that we can actually actuate based on insights that we're getting out of the predictive analytics? So this is really important, and it's very, very hard to bolt on predictive capabilities later on in the cycle. You can't start with a tech stack that's just built for the past, and then add on later data science and machine learning. You really have to get that right from the beginning. Second, enterprises really embrace open source and open formats when they're successful with data and AI. The reason for that are threefold. One, they want to really leverage the breadth of the ecosystem. In an open source community, there are lots of different tools, software being built that support these formats. They all work together and it just continues to grow. That way you can leverage this ecosystem that's being built every day. Second, the cost of portability. By leveraging open source, you know that you can always migrate from one vendor to another vendor that supports the same open source project. These open source projects tend to live much longer than any one particular vendor, and that's great because that gives optionality to these enterprises. And third, it helps with the learning curve. This technology is not always easy to understand. Open source makes it much, much simpler because you can hire people from the community. You can read books about open source technologies. There are massive online open courses that you can just leverage. That way, it's much easier for the organization to learn and train uh, their uh, people. And three, most companies today that really are strategic about their data stack are leveraging multi-cloud. Why is that? Well, one, 
when we look at enterprises today, their cloud spend is actually one of the biggest expense items. And they haven't even moved all their data to the cloud yet. So they want to be able to have some kind of cost leverage. They want to have flexibility. They want to be able to say, I have options. I could move between these different clouds. Give me a good price. Second, they want to leverage the strengths of each cloud provider. They're all good at different things. Some are good at security. Some are good at machine learning. Some have awesome DevOps APIs. Use the best of breed. Don't lock yourself into just one of them. And third, external factors matter, like regulations or customer demands. Some of our customers themselves have customers that demand, I can't be on that cloud because it competes with me. Or in this particular region, I want to be on that cloud. Or if they're regulated, they actually have to be multi-cloud. Uh, otherwise, they're breaking the law. And then finally, and this one is the most surprising, is that the ones that are further along, they have a simple data architecture. So what does that mean? Well, they use one governance, security, and lineage model for all of their data. Instead of having lots of different vendors, and then in each vendor's software specifying governance, or security, or lineage for the data sets, they'll just have it in one place. Second, they're trying to avoid as much as possible having multiple copies of the same data. Have one in the data lake, have one in the data warehouse, have one in the streaming system. That creates a lot of data ops, a lot of DevOps, and frankly, more opportunities for things to go wrong. And finally, they just want to reduce the number of software vendors that they're using for their data stack. It's having 9, 10, 15, 20 vendors is just more complicated. So it's easier to just simplify it down to a few architectural elements. Unfortunately, the vast majority of companies are struggling to get this right. They're not following these four principles. Why is that? Well, the reason is that the stack that they have today is super complicated. Essentially, all enterprises today store the majority of their data first and foremost in a data lake. But then on top of that, to make value out of that data lake data, they have to build four separate stacks. They need to have one stack for data warehousing. That's where you use your SQL. You have your data analyst. That's a whole stack where you do EDLT, data warehousing, BI. That's separate from if you want to do data engineering, where you want to have your batch workloads. There, you might be using Spark, and you're using orchestration engines. And maybe you prefer using languages like Java or Scala. That's a separate stack. And then if you want to do more streaming, that's yet another stack, different type of people you have to hire. Now you have to use schema bus like Kafka. You have to build streaming engines. You have to use real-time databases. And then finally, to do machine learning and AI, you leverage yet another stack where you're now using data science and machine learning and model monitoring and these things. This is very complicated. In the end of the day, you really just have one type of data. You have customer data in one form or another, and you want to leverage that to do different types of analytics. Why should you have to build four separate stacks? So why is all this complexity there? Where does it stem from? Well, it turns out that it's actually three roots of evil here. One, you have two separate copies of the data in two incompatible systems, one which is open, which is the data lake, and one which is proprietary, which is the data warehouse. And these two systems are not compatible. Second, you have incompatible languages and interfaces. You have a SQL stack, and then you have a Python and Java stack, and these two don't mix well. And then finally, you have to do governance and security models for different systems in different places. In the data lake, it's all about files. In the data warehouse, it's all about tables. And that creates an impedance mismatch between these two. So at Databricks, we're very excited about the new paradigm, which is called the data lake house. The way that works is that you have your data in the data lake that all the cloud providers offer. And on top of that, using a technology that I'm going to be talking more about called Delta, you're able to actually blend both of these worlds and get the best of data lakes and data warehouses. You, on top of that, have one common security and governance and administration. And then on top of that, you can support all the different use cases that come in the stack. So what are the advantages of the data lake house? Well, one, it's a lake-first approach. So all this data that enterprises have loaded into their data lakes, they can now use it right there. They don't need to copy it anywhere else. They can just use that data in place. Second, this stack is built with AI and machine learning from the ground up. So the whole platform supports predictive technologies everywhere. Third, it's multi-cloud by definition, because you support the data lakes that all the cloud providers are providing. And most importantly, it supports and has built-in capabilities for data engineering, for data warehousing, for real-time streaming, for data science and machine learning. And finally, this whole architecture is open. So it's based on open source standards and open file formats. So now that you have a data lake house, 
you can do SQL workloads directly on it. You can get great state-of-the-art data warehousing performance for BI and SQL directly on your data on the data lake without having to copy it to a separate data warehouse. It has a native SQL interface for analysts, and it supports BI tools directly. For machine learning workloads, it has built-in model registries for your machine learning models. You can reproduce those models, and you can productionize them. You can leverage Delta Lake for reproducibility. And today, we also have AutoML, which helps citizen data scientists who do not want to write code, who want to get started with machine learning and data science. The collaborative workspace on Databricks is a great way to democratize data science, data engineering, and data analytics. It comes with collaborative notebooks that kind of look like Google Docs. They have dashboards for interactive analysis. You can work together online. It has native support for Python, Java, R, and Scala. And it's integrated with Delta Lake. And then finally, data engineering workloads are the key component of the Data Lake architecture. So the whole platform comes with a data orchestration layer that lets you schedule all your pipelines. It comes with Delta Live Tables, which lets you manage the whole end-to-end -end life cycle of your pipelines. And finally, it simplifies data engineering with curated data lakes. So how did we do this? What's the secret sauce? How were we able to keep these two architectures together and actually get the best of both worlds? Well, let's examine the data lake where it all started. In the data lakes, all enterprises are storing most of their data. But unfortunately, it's really hard to get reliability and quality out of that data because you've just dumped all your data in a place. You kind of have ended up with a data swamp where you can't really control the quality of that data. And even if you figure out the reliability of that data, you'll have issues with performance because you didn't put that data there in a specific way so that you would actually tailor it for great performance downstream. And even if you figure out the performance, you have security challenges. Because you have the data lake where the data is stored, but it's all files. So you can't actually understand the contents. You can't say, I don't want this column in this file to be visible to anyone else. And then on top of that, it's really hard to run traditional data warehousing workloads, let alone SQL. So how did we do this? Well, with the Delta Lake project, you have your data in the data lake. But Delta enables you to get asset transactions, which are known in the data literature to provide reliability and quality to your data sets. Now you know that all your data is correct, and you can have schema that you're enforcing on that data. Once you have that, you have the reliability and quality in place. We also add indexing and caching and auto-tuning to that data that you have in the data lake and that you've collected over the years. So now you can actually get great performance downstream. And on top of that, we now provide a lake house security model where you can get fine-grained security all the way down to columns and rows and tables or files, so you can get best of both worlds. And on top of this, we've built analytics, ML, and streaming, and batch. And it comes with full Python and SQL support. So how are others leveraging the data lake house? Well, I want to talk to you about Atlassian, one of my favorite partners. So Atlassian, and these are these slides that they actually showed earlier at Data and AI Summit, they began in 2015 using just data warehouses. And they stored all their data in the data warehouse. But that architecture had lots of problems. Multiple copies of the data to try to keep in sync. It was really hard to do data science and machine learning. They couldn't get all their data into it. So for that reason, they went all the way to the other extreme. And in 2016, shifted to data lakes. So started storing everything in these open data lakes. But then they ran into problems with performance, dimensional modeling. And it was really hard to make this work and make this self-service because it's pretty complicated to get data lakes working. So today, they now have moved towards a centralized data lake house. And in the centralized data lake house, they can now have a single lake house and no other data any other place. It's multi-petabyte. Over 3,000 people are touching that system at Atlassian. And they have over 200 data workers that are actively working on uh, putting data sets in there and building machine learning models and make Atlassian awesome. So in short, the Databricks Data Lake platform enables you to do all your data analytics and AI in one platform. Now you can have data engineering, BI and SQL, and data science and machine learning in one place. And that's what we're going to deep dive into the rest of this afternoon. We'll have talks that deep dive on data engineering, BI, SQL, and data science and machine learning. Now I'd like to welcome Michael Ombras, creator of Delta Lake, to the stage.